when the couples counselors say, what did you do to make him yell at you, call you names, call you a bitch, all those things, what did you do? And the women are like, I didn't, I, I just said, like, did you see if the mail came when you came in, honey? And he blew up because the course we know, you and I know now, the rest of him already knew if he saw the mail. So half of him was cut out and she just killed him. And he felt just like he'd been killed. Welcome to yourbrilliance.com. I'm your host, Amy Waterman. Have you ever been in a relationship with a partner who said nasty things to you? Things like, you're always so negative. You're never happy. You're controlling. You're manipulating him. You're using him. You make him sick. Something's wrong with you. <laughs> I have. And like a good partner, I immediately thought, okay, I need to look into this. What am I doing to make him feel that, that way? How can I adjust my behavior to be a better partner? Because you see, if it was my fault, then I had power. I could fix the problem by changing myself. That's when I found a website called verbalabuse.com. Now that phrase, verbal abuse, can sound scary, but it's not. It describes a pattern that plays out in many relationships. And if we can understand what verbal abuse is, what causes it, and how to stop it, we'll be able to create better boundaries and we won't accept love that hurts us. Our guest for today, Patricia Evans, is the creator of verbalabuse.com and the author of the very first book, about verbal abuse, which is now in its third edition. She's an internationally recognized interpersonal communication specialist who's appeared on shows like Oprah, CNN, and CBS News. She has studied more than 30,000 cases of verbally abusive relationships, and she gives speeches and conducts workshops throughout the country. Welcome, Patricia. Well, thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here with you, Amy, and to be able to share some of the knowledge that people are searching for, you know, that you know. <laughs> I know well, you know. You that. have, I just want to start out by saying, you have changed the lives of so many people. You have changed my life and you've changed the lives of people I care about. And of course, not to mention the countless readers and visitors to your website. So thank you. You're so thank welcome. you I'm for so everything glad. you've done. I'm so glad. Thank you for telling me. <laughs> So for people watching, not everybody has heard the term verbal, verbal abuse before. Right. So let's start out with what is it? Like, is it when your partner shouts and swears at you? Yeah, that's definitely, <laughs> nobody's going to swear at me. I mean, it's fine if you bump yourself or spill your tray or do something, you know, um, or the kid runs across in front of you and you drop things. Um, you might say, oh, damn, or oh, hell, or oh, OMG, you know. But you're not saying to the kid, you little brat, you're not defining that child. You're not taking away his consciousness. You're just saying, please don't run in front of me again. <laughs> and that's okay. But when your spouse in the story you told, told you that you were, what did he say, oppressive or uh, controlling, you know, that's abusive. He could say you're, you're a bank robber, you're a controller, you're uh, a killer. Um, those things are abusive. If he said, oh, honey, when you tell me that um, you don't want me to wear these old jeans when I'm mowing the lawn, because you'll have to wash them, um, I feel controlled. And then so then you would say to him, well, just tell me I'll wash the jeans and I, I'm going to wear, it. you know, and so he can't say you're a controlling person, but he was defining you. And you were like, oh my gosh, he's angry at me. There's got to be something I can do. I must have this power to hurt him. I must have the power to help him. And so you were looking for something to do to help him. Yes. Yeah. But what I want all our listeners to know, what I want them to understand is why he doesn't feel crazy or insane or not sane or silly or something to tell you um, what you want, like you want to argue or to tell you how you feel. Yeah. You're not sick. 
you're not, you don't care, or you're making a big deal out of something. It's not real. Okay. How come he doesn't feel crazy? He doesn't feel crazy as most people do. I can't just walk up to somebody anywhere in a, like say a whole fair or something and say, Hey, I know what you think. You think you're superior or you think you want this, or you think this, this is um, nothing. No one can do that. No one can do that or they feel crazy. So, but he doesn't feel crazy when he tells you what you are or what you're doing or what you think or how you feel things like that. He doesn't feel crazy. And this is the key. You have to know this, that he lost a part of himself in childhood, his warm, receptive, nurturing, emotionally intelligent, intuitive self. We could call it his feeling function. And there are studies done where tests are done in colleges on knowing you, the, all the feelings. You have four feelings, thinking, feeling, sensate, and intuitive. We navigate earth with our senses and we we also can tell, um, you know, just how we feel. That's scary place or something. Or our intuition will tell us, don't go there, you know. Um, so anyway, we navigate Earth with our functions. And his, his feeling function is gone. It's been wiped out. It's been shut up. Don't cry. Don't be a baby. He's just suppressed his feelings to a degree that he's now made you, the rest of him, you are his feeling, warm, receptive, nurturing, emotionally intelligent self. You're the rest of him. You're his other half. In his mind, without thinking about it, you're his other half. But wait a minute. If you show up saying, I don't want to go there, or I, I love that dinner where they sit at that restaurant, but I don't like the dinners they serve there, or anything that doesn't match his mind, he feels attacked. And I bet you he said to you so many times, you're attacking me. You're attacking me. Why would he feel attacked when you like something different or more or less than he does? Because when you don't match his mind, then the part of him that's you seems to fade away, disappear. Half of him is going away. Half of him is disappearing. And a man called me one day and said, I just read your book, Controlling People. That's one that's the third book, and it describes the process of what happens. He says, I just read your book, and obviously he was in trouble, and probably he was trying to do everything he could. And he said, I read your book, and now I know why I threw my wife to the ground. I said, what? How? You threw your wife to the ground? He said, yeah, now I know why. Now I know why. I said, well, tell me about it. He said, well, I got home from work early and I love to cook. He was Southern cook type guy. And so he said, I love to cook. So I had all the burners going and I was cooking away. And then um, my wife came in from work and she said, hi. And I said, hi. And then she looked down at the mail. So everything stopped. She was looking at the mail on the table. She'd just come in and he felt like he'd been killed. He threw her to the ground. He beat her down and threw her to the ground. He said, now I know why. The rest of me, which she always had been, thinking what he thinks and wanting what he wants, was going to walk over and say, can I help you with the cooking? But suddenly that part of him that was over projected into her was gone. But so he felt like he was attacked, hugely attacked. So he threw to the ground. So um, what we can see is where all this craziness comes from is from people not really being whole and not really being able to have their emotional functions, their feel their emotions and have their feeling function working. The feeling function is what is just knocked out of people. Let's get into that at the end when we talk about your next book because that is going to be uh, a preview of what's coming up next but first i want to talk to you a little bit about some of the things that you were saying about how your partner thinks that he knows you better than you know yourself like in the beginning of a relationship yeah, he's wonderful. Sometimes actually he's actually even aware sometimes that that's what he thinks he'll say you know i know you better than you know yourself you know um <clears throat> And it's, uh, you know, it's like, 
it's more than just a, a having a fantasy about my wife is, you know, in, adores me or whatever his fantasies are. Um, but it's more than that. Psychologically speaking, he has projected a part of himself that never developed into her. She is now his warm, receptive, nurturing self. She is now his feeling function. And we all have functions, thinking, feeling, sensate, and intuitive. That's it. We all have these. And so his feeling function, um, you know, just never really developed. And that really just stems from the way he's treated as a child, you know, the way he's treated. Yeah. And a culture that says, toughen up, don't cry, toughen up, toughen up. Are you tough enough? You know? <clears throat> and so it begins to seem that to be a man, he has to be tough enough not to feel empathy. I think that's one of the biggest things that I learned from uh, your work is that you assume that your partner is like you, that when they yeah. hurt you, they hurt too, and that they feel terrible after they've yelled at you. And one of the real clinchers for me when I read your work is that I was always mystified as to, uh, so when I ever got into an argument with my partner, I felt sick afterwards and it took me days yeah. to recover because I felt guilt and I felt turmoil and I felt emotional disconnection. But on the other hand, when my partner would say those things to me, he would feel so good afterwards. He would be so happy. He would be so light and so free. And I couldn't understand why I felt terrible. And he seemed to feel just he felt fine. light and free because he squelched and quieted down real woman. So he could stay in his, place of psychological freedom to have you be the rest of him if you didn't think what he thinks or want what he wants or know what he meant he could have gotten really angry because part of him was going missing you know part of him like like for the man that looked down his wife looked down at the mail and my gosh she was supposed to come over to him and say oh honey can i help you with the cooking that was what he meant he just knew he knew all of a sudden he knew and then what he knew was gone and this woman's looking down at the male and the part of him that's projected into her has no place to go and so he's feeling attacked almost killed yeah. you know and so he's throwing her to the ground that is such a great story i put it in the third edition of the verbally abusive man oh just just verbalabuse.com yeah. what was it? verbally abusive relationship it's in the third edition of the verbally abusive relationship. Yeah, because I just so, had to tell it. What do we do then? So let's say what we do is we like that. And you know, would couples counseling work? Would talking well, to Well, I have I wanna say that when I finished the Oprah show and got to my phone, I had a call from a therapist in San Diego, California, and I live up by San Francisco. And she had talked to me about some things before and she said, um, I want to tell you, I don't want to forget to tell you, couples counseling doesn't work when abuse is the issue. And I never said much to any of my clients, but now and then I'd find one. One had gone to four different couples counselors over 12 years, four years here, three there, five there, like that. And, um, and every one, and then every single person who went to couples counseling said that it got worse. It just got worse. And it's because the couples counselors they happen to go to, and I don't know if they're teaching them differently now, but the couples counselors would, would have been taught that it's something like 50-50, or it's your part and his part. And so as soon as they say, what did you do? What did you do to make him say you were controlling? And you're just like, oh, I, I didn't do anything. I don't know. I've been trying to figure this out for years. <laughs> but when the couples counselors say, what did you do? to make him yell at you, call you names, call you a bitch, all those things. What did you do? And the women are like, I, did, I, I just said, like, did you see if the mail came when you came in, honey? And he blew up because the course we know, you and I know now, the rest of him already knew if he saw the mail. So half of him was cut out and she just killed him. And he felt just like he'd been killed when she said, oh, honey, did you see if the mail came when you came in? He went through this horrible feeling inside and he just exploded 
And when a person is feeling attacked by the reality around them, they will form a confabulation. And a confabulation is recorded like memory in their mind. So, so he forms a quick confa confabulation. All you ever do is expect me to keep track of everything for you. That's why I'm so angry, because he doesn't know that he just lost part of his psyche because she spoke up as if she was a separate person. So it's her individuality that triggers him. It's just always know in these difficult relationships, her individuality can trigger him. And her individuality showed up when she didn't know what he saw out there when he came in. So once, you know, so it's very important, but you're saying, what could we do now? What can we do? What we can do, you know, is um, talk to me, talk to Patricia. <laughs> it's, it's kind of important, you know, um, because in my consultations, I show women this problem. I show them what's wrong with them and why all this stuff she, she's tried doesn't really work. And then I ask her ahead of time to go to the appendix of one of my books for reminders, the Canny Change book. And there's an appendix with a couple hundred samples of abusive comments telling you what you, you are, you think, you want, you're trying to, you should, you need, you know, you don't know, you know, and there's nobody on our planet. I want everybody listening to know there is no one on this planet who can tell you what you want if they don't ask you. There is no one who can tell you what you think unless they say, what do you think of this? There's no one who can tell you any of these things unless they ask you. They can tell you you, you know, like you want to argue, usually when a woman brings up, honey, when you promised to call, if you were going to be late, and I let the dinner stay in the oven too long, and all, it really bothered me, could you always call? She's trying to bring up something, so now we'll have no more problems in our relationship. I'll just tell him what I need. I need you to call me. Okay, so she thinks now everything's going to be better, and of course, he feels like he's just about been murdered <laughs> he's been attacked it's going to be so much worse she's trying to control me she she um you know you're trying to start a fight is a big sentence that many abusers say you're trying to start a fight in her soul she's trying to make it all understood that i need that call and then dinner won't burn okay so she's trying to get it all settled out and make it all better but He's saying, you're trying to start a fight. Yeah. Well, you have to know that anybody who invades your mind is psychologically raping you, looking around and coming out with something the opposite, basically, of what you're really thinking or wanting. And they're telling you, you're, you're, these are your motives. You're trying to start a fight. It's the opposite of the truth because you're trying to make the relationship better. So they don't ask you, why did you bring this up? They just tell you. And so this abuse, this psychological rape, this erasure of your knowing, your inner consciousness, this erasure of consciousness is a great evil. And women eventually leave it. Unless they have, unless the, if, if a guy has heard the whole intervention, maybe I always say the more people, the better. You could give a party to all the first responders in your city. You know, call the police department, the fire department. I'm giving a big party, potluck, lots to drink out in the yard. We don't have to, we can all wear masks. <laughs> and you go out and you have this party and then you pull this out and then you read this intervention. I'm at, and I give the women what to say. I'm asking you to make every effort, blah, 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 you know, to not do this. So, and these are the examples. And then everybody that... In, in the whole area knows what he says to her. And he knows for the first time what he said to her because he doesn't care what he said to her. He doesn't think about it. He doesn't feel that bad feeling, oh, I said something hurtful, you know, like you were talking about. No, he's not thinking of any of that. So everybody knows. So then he can call me and then he can get into the program of doing a lot of reading, a lot of therapy and how to find the therapist and what to tell the therapist. So he has an extensive program. So it's not like there's little signs he's changing. He can't change. You should be separated if you're doing this program. And uh, then he could set, they, his wife, the partner, whoever this is, could set up, a, say, an hour a week for practicing 
good conversation. And then if that gets better and better and better and better, and it could be, let's do this for a couple hours, or let's do this Saturday afternoon, or let's do this for an afternoon, or let's do this for one day a week, and well, we can visit and go to a movie or do things. So if it's always improving and she's never being defined again, she knows he's changed. But that could take six months to a year of his therapy and all his reading and these little hour conversations and so forth. So it's a process. It's a process. Yeah. But um, now, I, it's just there. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. For those of you watching, if you want to find out more about verbally abusive relationships, get a copy of the verbally abusive relationship, schedule a phone consult with Patricia, or just find out more, we have a link for you. Just go to yourbrilliance.org slash abuse. That's yourbrilliance.org slash A-B-U-S-E. Patricia, thank you so much for coming on the show. And we're coming on to the end. And just before we close, I want you, would you give us a quick taster of what your next project is? What is next for you in the world of verbal yes. abuse? Well, I will be getting out a book within six months, I'd say. <laughs> I get busy. <laughs> but um, it will be Keeping Kids Safe from Verbal Abuse at home and at school. So there will be a section about how even in preschool, we can talk about real talk and pretend talk and what's okay and what's not and stuff so children can learn this early. And, and um, then we can also um, look at at home, what are you gonna say if you hear your, your spouse say something, get your stuff out of here. And you'd wanna say, please don't yell at our son. But if you say that, you know, you're saying I'm yelling, yeah, you are. Okay, I got that on video. I'm going to take the kid away from you. You're, you're um, doing all this awful stuff to me. See, you're, you're blaming me and calling me names and saying I'm mean and all that. So, so it can be very hard to figure out how to tell, how to speak up and protect your child. So how do you do that? Well, one of the ways you can do that, one of the things I've developed over time is an idea, which is you can say, hey, this is a safe home. We don't give orders here. We say please and thank you. And the child hears it. You're not saying daddy's mean. You're not doing parental alienation where he can take your child away from you. You know, you're just saying, hey, this is a safe home. We don't call people names here. Or hey, this is a safe home. You know, whatever is happening, you know, we don't yell at people here. We talk nicely. Um, so, so you can have, you can make a set of signs and I know a woman who makes signs. I'm going to talk to her about getting signs up on Etsy. <laughs> you can just order all these signs. <laughs> anyway, we'll see, but you can make these signs pretty simple, you know, big type or whatever. Um, so it, we have to teach this. This is a safe place. We don't, we don't call people names here. We don't put people down here. We don't do any of these things here because it's, um, you know, they have to have, be able to say something, you know, they have to, uh, you know, and then there's further things that can be done, you know, depending on where you live, you could wear a GoPro, you could tell them I'm going to record everything we say so I don't forget anything you tell me, sweetheart. There's that way. And then there's secret recording, which is in different states. And so you can look into a lot of other things. So I can help you with all those things too. That sounds so fantastic. I can't wait for your book. I will be oh, looking for you. it as soon as it comes out. Thank you so much, Patricia. Oh, and thanks. thank you out there for watching. Now, did you have any aha moments or insights while watching this interview? If so, share them with us in the comments. And for more interviews like these, make sure to subscribe to Your Brilliance TV here on YouTube, and then jump on over to yourbrilliance.com for more tips and insights on how you can live your most brilliant life. See you next time.